technology, the internet, GPS in the palm of your hand, autonomous operation. Technology is a driver of our times. Since its founding in 1958 in the midst of the Cold War, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has been a driver of technology. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's core of program managers, their job to redefine what is possible. My name is Ivan Amato, and I'm your DARPA host. And today I am pleased to have with me in the studio Paul Cohen, a program manager since 2013 in DARPA's Information Innovation Office, which is also known here as I2O. There he oversees projects with names like Big Mechanism and Communicating with Computers that are all about helping our all-too-human brand of intelligence collaborate with emerging computer-based artificial intelligences. It's a theme with deep roots at DARPA, spanning back decades. So thanks, Paul, for spending some time with me today. Thanks very much, Ivan. So given the projects you're overseeing here and which we will talk about in just a little bit, I'm intrigued by several aspects of your background. I hope you can talk a little bit about those. And two that really come to mind um, are that you have a degree that combines psychology and computer science. It's not a degree in computer science. It's not a degree in psychology, but it's one that combines those. And I'm also intrigued by um, your father, who I'm sorry to acknowledge passed away just a few months ago. Uh, but he also pushed and blurred the boundaries between humans and machines, in his case, in the realm of art. Uh, so I'm hoping that you can talk about those two things and other aspects of your background that would help us understand how it is that you uh, ended up here at DARPA and why you are pursuing the sorts of projects that you are here. Yeah, well, thanks for bringing up my dad. He was, uh, in many ways, uh, an inspiration to me. Th think back to the 1970s um, when... Not everyone had a computer. There weren't laptops. There wasn't an internet. Some people had computers. And computing was, at that point, sort of the metaphor of our times. Just as steam engines and electricity and other technology had sort of captured the imaginations of uh, scientists and poets throughout history, uh, the computer took on that role. Mm -hmm. And many people certainly my dad, uh, later me, started to think of the computer as a way of thinking about other things, how to make art, how the mind works. We started to think, well, maybe it's a computer, or maybe computational processes could do those things. But there's always been a tension in AI. Between, artificial intelligence. Yeah, sorry, artificial intelligence. Between whether you're using the computer as a model of what humans do or whether, you know, you're just modeling a new kind of intelligence. It's machine intelligence. And I think what's happened over the last 30 years is that all of us who started out interested in using the machine as a model of what humans do have now sort of come around to the fact that machine intelligence is its own kind of intelligence. Artificial intelligence these days actually has very little to do with human intelligence. Okay, and as you say that, that reminds me again of that combined That's degree. Right. So That's talk right. to me a little bit about, about that. Well, I mean, yes, I have a combined degree in psych cognitive psychology and computer science. Um, but remember, that was in the late 1970s. And we didn't even know what to call that thing then. It's more recently been called cognitive science. I attended the first cognitive science conference uh, at UC San Diego as an undergraduate. Um, but, but, you know, I was using the machine to study human thinking. Nowadays, when you talk about combining human and machine thinking, you're really talking about something else. You're talking about machine intelligence, its own kind of intelligence, meshing well with human intelligence, its own kind of intelligence. You're not talking about one trying to emulate the other or model the other or sort of stand in for the other. You're talking about two pretty mature kinds of intelligence. Paul, listening to the, the kinds of interests you have and the directions you're taking, this, this uh, does remind me that, that, it, uh, that your work really connects with a, a kind of a long history here uh, at DARPA in trying to really find out how a human intelligence and an artificial intelligence uh, you know, can, can work best together. Yes, that's exactly right. And I think for a really long time, people have viewed the machine role as sort of a power tool. So the machine is going to 
do the very heavy grunt work that we don't want to do. It'll do the proofreading. It'll sort of search the web. It'll, but it'll always do what we tell it to do. Right. And the word, the phrase data crunching comes to mind. Yeah, that you're crunching on data. Right? That's right. But, you know, let's, let's have no doubt about who's in charge and why the machine is doing things. We, so that's been our attitude towards machines. Machines are, you know, they're, they're like the tools in my toolbox. They act on my direction. They simply amplify what I want to do. Now, I want to change that. And my communicating with computers program has as one of its tenets that the machine must actually have something to say and something to contribute. <laughs> the machine is going to be creative. The machine is going to do some work of its own for its, for its own reasons. What I didn't count on is the enormous cultural barriers to that view of machines, even within my own program. Explain that a little bit more. That's Well, I mean, I, you know, within my own program, um, I, I do what most program managers do. I say, let's pick some use cases or applications that will, mm -hmm. you know, really drive this technology. And so you say to all of these superb scientists, tell me about some applications. And all of the applications they come back with have the machine in the role of a servant. And these are the best scientists in the world. So you say, no, come on. Imagine the machine was actually doing something for itself. And it really takes a lot of effort to, to think of machines as, you know, autonomous intelligences. Well, and I think you've gone so far as to challenge some of your performers, those who, who work with you on this program, to even think about the machine as a co Improviser, right? Almost like they're in a in a jazz group together. Could you yes. talk a little bit about that thought? Yeah. Well, actually, jazz is a very interesting form of communication, uh, very very similar to conversation. Insofar as there are there are pretty strict rules that govern the interchange between two jazz musicians, but there's also an enormous amount of creativity. But there are other similar use cases within the program. One is taking turns contributing lines to a story uh, or to a poem or to a recipe. And what we're finding is that when you look at a short poem that is written both by human and machine uh, and you show that poem to another human, that person isn't so good at picking out which lines were written by the human and which were written by the machine. I would consider that a metric of success. I, I think it is a metric of success. Given that this is a program, communicating w uh, with computers uh, is a program within DARPA, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, how do you imagine this new way of communicating with computers, assuming that you're ultimately successful in this, will, how will that change perhaps the way uh, those in, in the, the, the world of national security relate to computers or use them? Yeah, well, I think what one, one has to realize that the modes with which we communicate with computers today um, are extremely unnatural very, very cumbersome. We've sort of got, gotten used to it. Do you mean things like like keyboards? I mean keyboards, uh, but actually if you want a computer to do something, then you sort of have two choices. You can either be a programmer, and most people aren't, or you can use an interface that's been designed by a programmer. You can point and click and swipe and things like that. And neither of them is a, a very natural way of interacting with a machine. Uh, one of the goals- just, just on that point, so natural, for example, well, here we are talking, I'm looking at you, yeah. I'm paying attention to your facial expressions. Uh, I, I'm very gestural when I talk, so you can see uh, my hands going all over the place. Is that what you mean by natural sort of communication? I do. Mm -hmm. But the sentence I just said, I do, is also uttered during a wedding. But it means something completely different here than it does at a wedding, and that's because of context. And there has never been a good account of a computational theory of context that would support human-machine communication. And that's really the biggest technical problem in the Communicating with Computers program. It's that natural communication depends on context. And we've got to be able to represent context so that when I say I do, you don't think that I want to get married with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm upset, Paul. Yes, but, well, so, uh, live with it. I, I can. 
So how far along are you or, or your performers, which is sort of DARPA speak for those who end up working on particular projects, in uh, getting machines to handle context, to be able to discern context in the case of where there's an I do, where you're just saying, I agree with you versus uh, I want to marry you. So how far along are they? Well, we've uh, picked three big problems to work on in the program. And one of the things that distinguishes them is the amount of context that's available and the amount that has to be inferred. So the simplest problem is to build uh, uh, a sort of a castle out of wooden blocks on a tabletop. And the context that's available there is available to any computer vision system or to any human who can see. You can actually see the blocks. So when I say add another one, you can see what we're talking about. The context is right there. It's accessible. Then the second big problem we're working on is having humans and machines collaborate to build uh, very complicated models of biological systems. And there, the context is maintained by all kinds of clever machine visualizations. You know, this molecule talks to that molecule, and here's a great big network of molecules. What's the third use case? Yeah, so the third use about? case is this improvisation kind of use case. And there, the problem is that the context is established either by the notes that the musician plays or by the words that a person says, and nothing else. Just as in this conversation, context is established by the words and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Not 100% true, right? We both have shared common experience. So context is established by the words and this enormous background of human knowledge. That turns out to be extremely hard for machines. I have low expectations there. Mm -hmm. right? a, a machine, for example, would not know why um, I do in a particular context uh, is funny because it just doesn't know anything about how people get married and what, you know, it just doesn't All have right. that kind So what I'm knowledge. waiting for now is the greatest metrics, metric of success for me will be when, when, Paul, you, from your program, we get the first comedic computer. Let's segue then into your other uh, project at the moment, Big Mechanism. Yep. Well, uh, why are we doing Big Mechanism? We are doing it because I'm terrified uh, that our reach exceeds our grasp. We are um, in a state of human history where we can interfere with systems that we don't understand. And that's okay if you're making some small experiment in your lab and you happen to blow your lab up. But it's not okay if it's the climate or the economy, or any of the other huge systems on which we depend. So, so the problem is that we have really no good way of anticipating the effects of actions taken in very, very complicated systems. So Big Mechanism is a program to develop technology to help humans build models of complicated systems, models of unimaginable complexity, things that no human could possibly build alone. Okay, and I think one of the ways that you are hoping computers will be able to do this gets a little bit back to that sort of data crunching uh, brute force aspect, but this is right where maybe a computer could go into the scientific literature and read a hundred thousand or a million papers that are relevant to something like maybe oncology, the onset of cancer, or something like that, something that people can't do. Right. That's um, exactly what we're doing. So talk a little bit about that ability to kind of look at the information sphere in ways that just are impossible. But but then what will the computer be able to gather from just all of, all of that information? Well, so let me first describe what what we've actually built, and then and, and then I'll come back to your question. What we have now is uh, big collections of programs that read the scientific literature in cell signaling biology. Cell signaling is all of these molecular processes that produce effects in cells, including cancer. Machines can read those papers at the moment, and as you said, can read hundreds of thousands of papers. And out of every paper, the machine extracts a little piece of biological mechanism. 
you know, this molecule phosphorylates that molecule or binds with this molecule, that kind of thing. But every paper really talks about only a couple of little things like that. It may be a 10-page paper, but the main result is, like, tiny. So after you've read 300,000 papers, you have, say, half a million tiny little fragments of a big complicated mechanism. Little dots, little pixels of what might be a picture. That's right. Mm. Now you have to put it all together. And so that's the second big step in big mechanism is to assemble all of these fragments into a biological model. And then the third step is to reason with that biological model to solve problems. How would I drug this cancer? That kind of thing. So um, this is giving me a sense of where our two different kinds of intelligences really come together because we like to be able to tell stories. We like to have causal explanations, mechanisms for why things happen in the world. Um, and we are sort of good at that, but we are not great at, at seeing how 100,000 points and dots connect. We can see how 10, 20, and 30 might, whereas a computer now can bring in 100,000 points. But if we're working with it to, to say, computer, look at those points and also tell a causal story, then we're beginning to kind of work together. Am, am I getting yeah, a little and, bit of what you're seeking here? Yeah, and I want to be clear about why I think this is revolutionary. And to do that, I want to go back to the 50s when DARPA was started as a response to Sputnik. The United States began to emphasize sciences and engineering, but the United States also started to reward specialization in the sciences. And we've gotten to the point now where I can't understand what the guy in the office next door does. We have become highly, highly, highly specialized. Hyper-specialized. Hyper-specialized. The speed at which we read has not increased. So we read more narrowly. Now here's the problem. The world's existential problems do not fit neatly into any one academic department. They are systemic problems. And I can't think of a worse way to solve a systemic problem than to get a bunch of people who are experts in the tiniest aspects of that system. What we need is a big picture. And where humans can't, machines must. And humans can't. You know, I, I'm doing well to read 20 papers a week. But in order to understand a system, I need to read 300,000 papers. So, so this is very interesting. In, in a way, what you're saying, if you, if you look even just at a structure of, uh, of a university or even a company, you have sort of departments. Um, and um, we're, we're almost institutionalizing an inability to synthesize in this very broad-based way that you're suggesting. But the institutions continue to sort of put us into these compartments, whereas you're saying we now are in a place where we can combine our desire to synthesize with the, the, the powers that computers have for a new kind of a era of synthesis. A new kind of scholarship. That's why I view it as revolutionary. It's not just that a machine can read a large number of papers. It's that by doing so, we have a chance, just a chance, at understanding the systems on which we depend for our survival. Okay, so th that really is exciting to me. Uh, but as you know, there's a great dialogue going on in society now about you know what it means for computers to get smarter, to get more intelligent, to get smarter like us and intelligent like us, or smarter or intelligent in their own ways. And this brings up some concerns. It brings up excitement and concerns. I'd love to hear what you're excited about as the computers evolve this way, and in fact, as you have a role in that, and also, what gives you some pause? If people understood just how little machines were capable of, um, I, I think you wouldn't be hearing so much of this. Now, there are concerns. Well, I just want to push back a little yeah, bit yeah, there yeah. because, you know, in 1948, uh, Bell Labs rolled out a single transistor. It was an ugly-looking thing. Uh, and now you can get a chip that has billions on on something you know that that fits snugly in my palm. Uh, those are worlds apart. I mean, there's there was nothing much that little single switch could do. Uh, maybe do something in a telephone system uh, initially. And, and now we have microprocessors that do you know wonders on our even on our home computers. So so if we add time <laughs> to to the picture here. Uh, do you still think that people do not have uh, justification, have some concerns? 
I think that people are right to be concerned about fielding new technology uh, that can do harm. You know, self-driving cars could, I suppose, get people into traffic accidents. Um, of course, so do we. What, uh, the, so do we. <laughs> when we're exactly, behind the wheel. Right? Yeah. Um, the reason I'm not all that concerned is that this is not by any means the first time the society has come to grips with threats posed by new technologies. And we've always figured out how to deal with those threats. In one way or another, society finds ways to offset the costs associated with new technologies. We simply build it into the cost of doing business. All right, so we learn how to manage the risks. We manage the risk. And that reminds me of some specific ways DARPA is working to manage the risks of a coming era of artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm thinking here of programs like Explainable AI, which your fellow program manager, David Gunning, is running. And in that program, he's got the goal of developing artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques that not only produce results and gather data and make decisions to help human partners manage and operate the complex systems in our world, but AI systems that do this in ways that are transparent to the humans in the loop. And that way, the machine behavior remains understandable and explainable, and at least in theory, trustable. So I want to kind of move away from maybe the, the specific programs and ask you about DARPA as a part of the overall innovation ecosystem, and, and what I'm thinking about there as other elements in the ecosystem are, say, academics who are, who are, are thinking uh, uh, about very fundamental sorts of questions and doing maybe fundamental research, getting new data that hadn't been out there before. I'm thinking about entrepreneurs who are thinking about how to, how to apply science and, into, and turn that into various uh, small and large uh, technologies, um, and, and sort of where DARPA fits into all of that in, um, in, as we said in the very beginning, in, in being a driver of technology. Well, of course, DARPA has a very distinguished history as a driver of technology. Um, and we, we could talk about why it's been so successful. But, but maybe I could relate it a bit to my personal experience, which is I worked for DARPA as a performer for 30 years before coming here as a program manager. And I have to say, um, you know, I thought I knew DARPA pretty well, but it wasn't until I got in the building that I realized I was really I was seeing a, a pretty narrow slice of what DARPA does. DARPA sits at the intersection of government, industry, academia, and other kinds of research, and it brings it all together. It's, it's, uh, it's got this sort of big picture of how innovation happens uh, in the United States, and it's been very successful at... Uh, making it possible for everybody to do what they do best. You know, the work that goes on in academia tends to be, if I might say, a little conservative. Academics, I don't know if people will be surprised to hear this, but I think academics tend to be pretty conservative in the problems that they, they, uh, they tackle. So, so DARPA's role in academia is often to say, let's take on something that's impossible, and we're going to pay to get it done. You know, so for, that's, the, that's sort of the message to academia. Uh, the message to government is, look what's possible. We've just changed your view of what, what, what technology can do. Uh, think about how you can use it. Think about how you can uh, use it to achieve DARPA's mission of creating and uh, avoiding strategic surprise. Right. And listening to, to you talk about DARPA's place in the uh, innovation ecosystem and in, in moving technology forward, it also reminds me a little bit of what you were saying about big mechanism in bringing forth a new kind of synthesis, a new ability to take many different categories of thinking and bring them together. Uh, one thing that DARPA seems to do uh, is to bring communities together that do cross the disciplinary boundaries in ways that might not be uh, very easy for the performers in their own institutions. But here, as a program manager, you, in a way, can bring together five, six different performers together and create a community that just didn't exist before. So we talked about ultra-specialization a mo moment ago, and you just used the word disciplinary. And, mm. and, and I got really interested in the word interdisciplinary because... It occurred to me that I heard it every day at the university, and I hear it never at DARPA. Uh -huh. And I've come to view the word interdisciplinary as standing for a problem, not standing for a solution. 
And the reason that we don't hear that word at DARPA is that we just take it for granted. Everything we do at DARPA is interdisciplinary. All of my teams are interdisciplinary. I have machine reading people. I have linguists. I have biologists. I have, it's just taken for granted. Right. I mean, and if when I look at the, the P in DARPA, right, the projects, which another way of thinking about it is it's a sort of a problem-driven way of going about R&D. So if you have the end part of an endpoint in mind, you don't know exactly where you're going because these are leading-edge uh, areas, but you have some sense, then – Really, you're not saying this is a biology problem or a physics problem or an engineering problem. It's just a problem that has to be solved no matter what mindset or skill set you need to bring in. And it turns out that that may be a huge variety. Yeah, and uh, when people get to the project and they, they're they trained in machine learning and suddenly a cancer biologist is up there speaking, their eyes get big and the room gets quiet. And after a few weeks or months... They're the happiest people because this is the way science should be done, and they get to participate in that kind of science. On that note, I think we, we've uh, run out of our time for this discussion, uh, though I'm, I'm going to be eager to follow up with you uh, at some other times. And so I just want to thank you, Paul, for uh, joining me in the studio for, uh, for this really great discussion. Yeah, I've enjoyed it very much. Thanks so much, Ivan. And thank you, listeners, for joining us. And I hope you join us again for the next Voices from DARPA. For more information about Paul Cohen, his programs, and the rest of what DARPA does, and to find this and other episodes of Voices from DARPA, visit us online at darpa.mil.